Thanks, Derek. Uh, first of all, thank you for, to the organizing committee for inviting me. I, I think I was invited to be controversial. I'm happy to be controversial, but I'm also a bit uh, nervous about it uh, because I, I feel that this is uh, a core issue in uh, anesthesia and intensive care. Um, I have a few conflicts of interest um, in this area as uh, we uh, receive uh, research grants from uh, producers of uh, fluids. Uh, first, a few sort of uh, overarching uh, remarks. Uh, as you just heard Robert say, this is a drug. It will have effects, uh, some uh, quite obvious, some less obvious, uh, I'll go through some of this. Uh, but there are clear side effects. Um, and therefore, we have to be careful what we do. Increased fluid balances associated with uh, mortality, dysnatremias, both hypo and hyper, associated with increased mortality. So be careful. I'll try to cover this. How did uh, intravenous fluid at all become a very, very frequent intervention? Um, why do we give fluid? Does it work the way we give it? Um, and finally, try to sum up what should we do? As said, th this goes a very long way back. Uh, and Scotland is an important part of this. This guy uh, was Irish. I will not try to pronounce his name, but he took blood samples uh, of uh, patients during the uh, 18th century cholera epidemics. And he noticed that the blood drawn from the worst cases, as it says, it has lost a large proportion of its water. It has also lost, lost a, large, a great uh, proportion of its natural saline ingredients. So therefore, it was very logical that the Scotsman, Thomas Latta, very known, but also his uh, colleagues uh, in Edinburgh, um, gave fluid saline to substitute the loss of water and saline. So a, a new concept uh, was born. This really picked up during the Great Wars, uh, Second World War, here a picture from that, uh, the use of plasma and intravenous fluids. Again, uh, potentially for patients who had lost uh, blood volume. Uh, so this was sort of remained in the concept that we give something to replace a loss. Any major surgery, uh, this is a protocol from when I trained. Um, at the bottom, give fluids to those who have lost it. But now, new concepts appear. Here's two indications for fluid therapy during major surgery to patients who have not lost blood volume for epidural anesthesia, 500 cc's of the starch. And this third space lossing, so fluid that appears to disappear into a third space, give fluid for that. So, so I think this was a turning point and a potential new concept to give intravenous fluid to patients in whom who had not lost the fluid. Um, an anesthetist, and this is the most obviously famous example, took interventions done in the OR out to patients uh, out of the OR. Professor Bjorn Ibsen, we're close to the Holy Land, in Copenhagen, uh, obviously did this very well for positive pressure ventilation in the polio epidemic. Uh, at Blydons Hospital, the Blydons Hospital is not there anymore, so if you want to do a pilgrimage, you can go to uh, Kumun Hospital, a beautiful building which is still there. And it appears that, that Professor Ibsen was uh, more proud of his uh, makings there. He opened the first uh, ICU treating all kinds of patients with techniques uh, obtained in the theater. Uh, and he wrote a book about uh, shock therapy, uh, intensive shock therapy called really, really interesting uh, to read. It's in Danish, sorry. Uh, a lot of case reports, very detailed with uh, charts of patients as you see there. And he states that this is so complex that there can be no control group and therefore each patient is in his, own, his or her own control and we should learn from every, every case. And I think he did uh, very well and summed it up in this book from, uh, from 69. And the perceived 
uh, consequences for fluid therapy, at least within Danish uh, anesthesia intensive care, was this, that Ibsen, in his book, described that we should prioritize blood flow above blood pressure, and we should fill the circulation with dextrin and saline, guided by droplet filling at the temperature of hand and feet. And this, at least, was, in my impression, how it was perceived. Uh, so when, when I gave a, as a young specialist, gave a, th a talk at our national meeting uh, 15 years ago and suggested early infusion of noradrenaline in septic shock to control blood pressure, one of the professors in the room raised and announced that now Professor Ibsen must be turning in his grave. I apparently said some very bad stuff. So his influence on the way we uh, use fluid therapy, at least at that time, was still... Uh, enormous, at least in Denmark. And I guess it can be summed up in this very simplified physiological model that we focus a lot on what the left side of the heart does, uh, operate the patient on the Frank Starling curve and give fluids to those in, in whom we think uh, raise their point on the Frank Starling curve. And this was mimicked in, I guess, the most famous hemodynamic protocol uh, produced in intensive care, the uh, reverse protocol, where you see that filling of the heart here measured by CVP was number one, most important. Do that before you go to step two, which was vasopressor, and before step three, transfusion, and potentially an inotrope. So, in essence, I think, again, highlighting this sort of uh, simple approach that uh, Frank Starling uh, Law of the heart is important, and therefore it's heart important first to fill the heart with fluids before we proceed. It's obviously more complex, even though this is a simplification in itself. It now takes more consideration into, for instance, venous return function. And down here at the bottom, you see a new, or actually it's an old concept, but we sort of reinvented it within the last 10 years, mean systemic filling pressure, meaning that that changes in mean systemic filling pressure and thereby vasodilatation and potentially the infusion of vasoconstrictors can change the filling of the heart. And therefore this model is no longer just a, a physiological model to use fluid to fill the heart. It may be a model to promote the use of vasopressors early if the patient is vasodilated. Uh, so it, it is more complex than the simple model and obviously there are physiological models also to describe uh, the potential harm of fluid here, several suggested uh, pathophysiological mechanism to uh, induce uh, kidney failure by uh, fluid therapy. Uh, I think that I, th I think was, has been um, less prominent for us. We focused mainly on the left side of the heart in our perception of how to give uh, fluids. And the clinical data evolved. You know, as you know, three large trials challenged the original Rivers protocol. In all three uh, trials, more fluid was given in the intervention group. Outcome was not affected by uh, more fluid in these uh, complex protocols. In spite of this, the surviving sepsis campaign still recommends, I would say, a protocol that promotes a higher volume fluid Initial phase, give 30 ml to everyone, no matter their physiology or circulatory state, just give it. Um, followed by um, fluid administration continues along as the circulatory uh, state improves. Probably again, the thinking of the left side of the heart, Frank Starling, we should push patients uh, to the top of the curve. But as you see there, this is what is called a best practice statement, which in itself is uh, quite a funny name because it means there's no evidence uh, for this. Um, and we're challenged. So in spite of recommendations uh, given by the guideline group, there are no clean uh, IV fluid RCT in, uh, in adults. But as you probably saw yesterday, there's one in kids. The FEAST trial, 3,000 uh, kids with fever and circulatory impairment randomized to no fluid bolus versus saline versus albumin. 
stopped early because of increased mortality in the two fluid bolus uh, groups. Many subgroups presented uh, in the primary publication, and as you saw yesterday, Kath presented even more subgroups. Uh, no indications of uh, improved outcome by fluid bolusing in any subgroups uh, among these kids. So harm in everyone, it appears. So at least for septic patients, I would sum it up this way. The circulatory failure is extremely complex in these patients. A lot of them have not had overt fluid loss, and therefore they do not fulfill the original concept of, the, of giving intravenous fluid. That's to substitute what was lost. Uh, giving IV fluids to these patients built on a very simple physiological model. No proven benefit in trial, even indirect uh, evidence of harm. And therefore, we opened a, a trial program called CLASSIC, uh, tried to build a protocol of restricted uh, fluid resuscitation in uh, patients with septic shock. Uh, pilot trial, because we thought it was so difficult to ask Scandinavian anesthetist intensivists to stop giving IV fluid, so we want to be sure that the protocol worked. Um, nine Scandinavian ICUs, published uh, results in November in intensive care medicine, uh, set uh, multi-center randomized feasibility trial. We randomized ICU patients who had septic shock, and importantly, they had received the initial 30 ml of initial fluid resuscitation. So this trial challenges the ongoing fluid uh, therapy, either received a restrictive protocol or a protocol aiming at standard care. So randomized, no adrenaline, all of them mean pressure of 65. And given the intervention group basically had fluid resuscitation stop, but a fluid bolus of 250 to 500 could be given if any of this uh, bad stuff ha happened, defined as severe hyperperfusion as either lactate above four, severe hypertension in spite of no adrenaline, mottling, and severe oligoria, but only in the first two hours. We didn't want patients with established AKI to receive repeated uh, fluid boluses uh, and therefore obtaining large uh, positive fluid balances. Standard care arm was aiming at the surviving sepsis campaign recommendation for ongoing fluid therapy, meaning give fluids as long as the circulation improves. Choose your own parameter to define improvement. Both groups could have uh, replacement of overt loss, and we didn't allow colloids to be used for circulatory pain in this protocol. Being a feasibility trial, the uh, primary outcome was the volume of uh, resuscitation fluid here in the first five days. Clear difference, uh, 1.5 liters difference median between the two groups. And as you see here, these are percentiles in both groups. So the difference appeared in the full spectrum of uh, disease severity. If if the volumes given is a marker of uh, disease severity, both those who received little and both and those who received uh, more fluid, there was a difference between these two groups. We asked clinicians why did you give fluid to this classic trial patients? And they answered based on lactate, noradrenaline dose or, or mean arterial pressure, or oliguria. And this actually reflects what the majority of clinicians have answered in surveys um, in both the European and global point prevalence studies. These are the indications why intensivists give fluid to patients. The first question is, does fluid improve these markers of hyperperfusion? We produce, I think, the first randomized data to assess this. These are the levels of uh, lactate, noradrenaline dose, and urinary output in the first 24 hours um, after randomization into the classic trial. You see the two groups are identical. Well, I put on the estimated mean differences there for you. Absolutely no differences in markers of hyperperfusion between patients receiving more or less fluid after the initial resuscitation. More importantly, we assessed some exploratory outcome measures. As this was a feasibility trial of 150 patients, 
Uh, the trial was not powered for this, but they all favored the fluid restriction, so death by an A90, ischemic event in ICU, and worsening of AKI, did so with statistical um, significance. So for fluid resuscitation, we are sort of, I think, set back. We don't know the safe volume. We do not know which triggers we should use. We do not know which targets we should use. There is increasing evidence uh, of harm uh, from also resuscitation fluids. Uh, we urgently need large trials and probably several large trials to answer this complex question. We obviously give intravenous fluid for other indications uh, and I've tried to list here what we may do to critical ill patients. We, um, this is the list. Before going through the list, there is an important published systematic reviews looking at conservative fluid management or de-resuscitation strategies in patients with sepsis uh, and or ARDS. So this is a bit later in the phase. This is not initial resuscitation, but more late fluid management. Uh, actually, a, a number of trials on this, and as you see there at the bottom, more than uh, 2,000 patients randomized now into these uh, trials, and this is mortality, point estimate there at the bottom. Again, favoring fluid restriction, not so with statistical significance, though. Um, what differed uh, with statistical significance was the number of ventilator free days, so fewer uh, days of the ventilator for those who were managed with a restrictive or de-resuscitation protocol. Uh, so this is important to keep in mind when we go back and look at why we give fluids. I've marked these green because I will not challenge the indications for fluids for those who lose it. I mean, this was the original concept from cholera. You lose fluid, you give it. Uh, and also deficit, so if there's specific, a specific deficit, give what's lost. You may do so orally rather than intravenously. Um, for IV contrast, I've stopped giving fluid prior to IV uh, contrast exposure, mainly based on the, uh, what's called the AMAZING trial, uh, recently published in The Lancet, showing no effect of prophylactic uh, uh, rehydration before IV contrast and potential harm, increased rates of um, heart failure in patients in the fluid group. So I, I don't think there's a good indication to give IV fluids before IV contrast anymore. Rhabdomyolysis is really, really difficult. Um, to my knowledge, not a single trial based on very, very, very simple physiological and passive physiological uh, explanations and, and I guess observations made during earthquakes. Uh, so I put two question marks uh, on that. And then the last one there, maintenance. Difficult as well, should we give um, critically ill patient daily maintenance fluid on top of the rest. Uh, this is again data from uh, the classic trial showing the amounts of fluid that we give as drugs, nutrition, so this is both intravenously and oral, and oral fluid. So already on day one, which was short in this trial, this was from randomization to the next uh, day, one liter, and then two liters uh, all days. So I would question if these patients would need, on top of that, maintenance fluid when they receive two liters uh, of fluid already. The majority of them will, in any case, be uh, in positive fluid balance uh, at this time. So a patient with positive fluid balance receiving two liters of uh, different fluids, should this patient receive more? I don't think so. If you still want to do this, I think you should do a trial. So two question marks on uh, maintenance fluids as well. So what should we do? Well, I think we should, as Robert said, learn that this is a drug. It has effects, some of them not so clear, but it has clear side effects. And we should do trials. I think this is very complex. There will have to be done several trials on resuscitation, on maintenance, on the use of fluid for rhabdomyolysis, and we need to do them now because we are potentially harming patients. Again, those who lose it, this was the original concept, please give 
but give what they have lost. This goes for bleeding, diarrhea, or even cholera. Um, I still give uh, fluid for resuscitation, but I choose what Ibsen called cold shock. So Ibsen too differentiated his approach. So he mainly gave fluid to those who had cold shock, so signs of low cardiac output. There I, from a physiological point of view, would expect a larger benefit than to patients who have normal or even elevated cardi cardiac output. Ibsen warned about these patients, high output failures he called them, and suggested to give vasopressors to, uh, to these patients, obviously. Only repeat the fluid bolus if markers of hyperperfusion uh, improves. It's been shown again and again that we do it repeatedly without taking notice of how the effect was of uh, the first bolus. And always when considering giving IV fluids, consider the potential side effects for the specific patients because you're now giving a, an unproven intervention. Therefore, there cannot be side effect for the specific patient. Consider the oxygenation, the fluid balances, and the sodium balances to limit the input to those who are in more immediate risk of side effects to intravenous fluids. We will, I hope, get funded to do a, a large uh, phase three trial on resuscitation fluid, uh, now many, many years after the concept was developed, uh, called the classic trial again, uh, 1,300 patients, powered for mortality, I hope. And when we get results, hopefully we will get more or less of these blunt data, blunt statements, and more data to support a more evidence approach. I appreciated the value of Mike Pinsky a lot, but he stated that peripheral edema is a cosmetic concern. Another pioneer and giant in our field, he sort of said the opposite. I've considered noradrenaline to be the fluid of choice for septic shock for the last 25 years. Both these statements, they cannot be right. We need data to eliminate those rather blunt statements which I think do not help uh, us advance the care of our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. <coughs> so, so can I start with two questions? Absolutely. So, Hopefully there's no time for that. <laughs> um, so the first question is... Um, uh, you talked about Kath's trial uh, mm -hmm. now, and you pointed out that her signal was true across almost every subgroup, mm -hmm. including lots of children who would have had cold shock. Mm -hmm. But you still suggest that you give fluid for cold shock, mm -hmm. and in your review of the questions to be asked, I didn't see in there whether you even wanted to challenge the dogma of yeah. uh, the bolus, yeah. and whether the yeah. bolus should be on the table. Yep. Uh, something needs to be addressed. Yep. That's question number one. Question number two, at least in the conservative fluid arm in the ARDSNET trial, mm. um, although it didn't change mortality, it appeared to have short-term benefit by shortening mm. length of stay mm. in ventilator-free days. But there was a, su a suggestion that it worsened mm. neurocognitive outcomes. Yep. And so I wonder if you could comment both for the classic trial and for trials in yep. general yep. on your comment about fluids and oxygenation and, mm. and, and what do we actually think the outcomes should be? Because it may well be in these broad patient populations, there could be a small change in mortality, but important effects mm. on long-term organ dysfunction. I yep. wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I'll take the last one first. I think that's the easiest. So, so the, I think Derek alludes to a, a uh, sub post hoc analysis of a subgroup of patients who had cognitive function assessed in this fluid restriction arm. And, and it appeared, at least in this uh, subgroup, that cognitive dysfunction at long term was impaired with fluid uh, <coughs> restriction. I, I think this is a very important signal for us to assess long term outcomes. And, and we will do so in the classic. Uh, phase three trial, so both uh, quality of life and cognitive function will be assessed at one year. Um, so I, I think that the, even though it's an interesting uh, post hoc analysis, I, I think the methodolo methodological weaknesses uh, hamper the direct implication yeah. of it. But it's a warning, and we should uh, obviously assess long-term outcomes. 
regarding the bolus, uh, and, and it's, it's true, I, I still use boluses, whatever that is, because I'm, it's, I, did, I do not do what CAT do, did in the trial. That was sort of injection of 20 mils per kilo. I, I think I hang a drip and let it drip. That's what I call a bolus. And obviously these techniques should be trialed as well. How should we administer fluid, as alluded by, by uh, Robert? There are kinetic differences, and we need to translate these observations into clinical practice by doing trials of different ways of giving also resuscitation fluid as a slow infusion, medium-sized infusion, or rapid infusions, for instance, would, would be one way to go. So, so we have a long way to go. My practice is by no way perfect, but I, have, I work in an environment where there are nurses, other doctors who look after the patients that I also see. And, and our culture comes from this side, and now we're moving probably some way this side, and there will be one step uh, taken at a time, and we'll see how low we will go and how we should do it. But, but in my opinion, there is the only way to go is to do randomized trials because it just is so complex. Uh, but we have to do a lot and therefore, we need all the hands we can get to do this. Uh, I have uh, one question, partly from the audience and partly from my own papers. Um, in, in perioperative medicine, uh, there's quite good evidence that the individual dosage of fluid is the right, right dose. Each patient should have uh, his or her own dose. Uh, in the ICU studies, comparing fluids, uh, it's quite the opposite. Uh, you give uh, a certain number of milliliters per kilogram, and then you uh, make a deduction from it. Is it the, isn't it very probable that some of those patients will have the right dose, some the wrong dose, or some too much? Yeah. I would first challenge the evidence in perioperative medicine. Trials are still being done, so, so at least some investigators are, are not. I mean, Optimize 2 is being done. I think it runs here in Sweden as well. So, so it's. It's not that we have settled, oh, I'm, I do not do perioperative medicine anymore. It's not that it's settled that, that goal-directed therapy is standard, should be standard care, I think, in perioperative medicine. Uh, and I, I would hope that, that incentive is uh, to uh, give individualized uh, therapy and, and the second part of the surviving sepsis campaign at least indicate that this should be done, give fluid as long as the circulatory uh, state improves. So that's probably stroke volume optimization done very varyingly with varying uh, variables, but, but I think the concept is the same. So I would hope that we too give individualized care. We obviously have the challenge that, that, that the intervention period is several days, whereas in uh, OR it's a few hours. Uh, so, so the concepts will not be interchangeable. Um, I think the, again, focusing too much on what the left side of the heart does may eliminate a lot of good physiology, actually. And we're, I guess, a specialty that have made pride of being physiologists. But we've got forgotten some of the physiology, and that's the physiology of harm. And uh, venous return function, stuff we can't measure, mean systemic filling pressure. So I'm concerned about this stroke volume optimization moving into the ICU. Okay, any more questions? Well, thank you very much for this excellent. Thank you. Thank you.